Welcome to the Scrum.org Community Podcast, a podcast from the home of Scrum. In this podcast, we feature professional Scrum trainers and other Scrum practitioners sharing their stories and experiences to help learn from the experience of others. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, and welcome to the Scrum.org Community Podcast. I'm your host, Dave West, CEO here at Scrum.org. Today's podcast, we're going to talk about project to product. And actually, there was a conference that um, that you may have heard about a few weeks ago in New York City. And I'm very fortunate to have the author of Project to Product, Dr. Mick Kirsten, CTO at PlanView, join me today to talk about this conference and to really talk about what he took away and what I took away, share that those insights and, and see where that goes. So welcome to the podcast, Mick. Thank you, Dave. Great to be here. It's so glad you could join us at the event as well. And uh, yeah, really enjoyed your talk. So I hope we dig into that some. Oh, we we might do. Yes, this is, uh, I think this might be your third podcast with us. So I'm, you're an old timer. So I'm, I'm excited to have you here, have you here again. All right. So for the listeners, just a quick recap. Um, Project to product is the idea to really perform in the digital age. You need to look at your capabilities that you deliver to your users in a different way, a product uh, lens. Um, and you, you need to discard projects as the primary vehicle of doing work. The uh, That has a huge impact on your organization. And the purpose of the event was to really talk about that, share learning, share experiences, and um, and and the like, and that, as I said, it was in New York City a few weeks ago. So let's begin at the beginning. Um, what was your biggest takeaway from the from the event, Mick? It was it was actually a bit of a surprise to me. My biggest takeaway, and it was it really came when I realized the nature of some of the presentations and the fact that the, some of the organizations as well is that we've definitely crossed some kind of threshold in terms of this not being just something for the visionaries or early adopters, but now you've got these very pragmatic organizations, you know, you can call them laggards, you can call them pragmatists, whatever, whatever the word is, the more conservative organizations who are not necessarily looking for that revolutionary edge over their competition, but are now being told to implement a product operating model. And just the way that we saw that framed by some of the, the very good presentations from the strategic consultancies, you know, McKinsey spoke, Bain spoke, and so on, uh, really you know, helped me realize that. And it also, helped, you know, I think, was a very, uh, a very stark realization, realizing these companies actually need a lot more handholding and guidance than maybe they've been given in the past. And that certainly that they were given in the project to product book. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I think that that was definitely something I saw as well. Why do you think these organizations are now coming to the realization that agile DevOps, you know, new technology isn't enough and they need some sort of unifying paradigm or a change to their unifying paradigm of how they invest, align and uh, and 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 think about the work that they're doing. What, what what do you think the catalyst has been? It's a good question. Because I and just going back to the to the beginning, Dave, I think that same change we thought agile would be that change, right? It's some of the concepts we're talking about around focusing on customer, focusing on outcomes and flow and alignment and mindset. That that was what was being spoken about two decades ago in terms of these these agile models. And I think part of it is It'd be great to get your thoughts on it as well. Is that that a lot of that kind of played out its course, helped some organizations transform, certainly helped the way that top performing organizations operate. But I think it was relegated as too much of a change for IT, for technology to do, right? It was never meant to be that. Like yeah. we were meant to be agile from a business point of view, a company point of view, a customer centric point of view. Um, and so I think what's happened is partly because that had a ceiling that shouldn't have been there, those those agile transformations. People, lots of people have agile teams, but but not an agile organization or business. The product operating model is just that extra layer of the cake that agile should have provided, but but I think for almost accidental reasons, didn't. 
So I think we're now at the point where there's enough evidence, and that, that's actually why it was nice to have McKinsey present some of that evidence uh, and some of the work that they did. Scrum.org has done some great work on this. Uh, at Plan View, we had the project product in industry report, but it, it's all the same thing, which, which is it points with various surveys or statistics or data to the fact that organizations with a product operating model, which really is an operating model that supports agile um, and engineering and, and, uh, and modern ways of working for, for software developers and engineers, um, that those organizations are just, va just vastly out outperforming those who haven't. So I think there's now been enough time that leaders, SIs, um, boards are saying, no, it, it's time for you to make a switch. You're, the, the digital transformation as a series of, a, a set of new ceremonies didn't work. It's time to change the operating model to be agile. And that's the product operating model. Yeah, yeah, and and I, I think ultimately digital products are here to stay, right? And and digital is a significant component to every business value stream, every business process, every engagement with customers, e even if it's just a physical thing like I don't know diapers. You know that there's an yeah. a, there's a digital element at the very least in terms of. Uh, organizations having you know supermarkets having them on the shelves you know uh, encouraging them to buy those diapers rather than somebody else's diapers integrating with you know the um, couponing systems and all that kind of stuff ultimately digital is, is everywhere though I, I do I don't I'm not going to be a doomsayer because that is not as you well know my 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 style however you know we heard over and over again, one of the biggest challenges to adopting this, this way of thinking, to transversing the project to product approach really is the engagement with the business. And I looked around that room and yes, there were a few people from business, um, mostly actually finance, uh, 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 well, enterprise product ma project management organizations, which was uh, ironic considering the title of the, of the, of the, group, of the, uh, of the event. But the majority of people were still IT people, technology first people. So I'm a little bit worried that, that, that this will just be like agile uh, in, in, in regard to it's, oh, well, that's, that's what you software people do. Scrum's for your software developers and, and nothing more. Do you think, did that worry you? Does that worry you or, or not? Absolutely. So I think if we go through, you presented some of the evolution, right? There's the agile, there's like this team focused start of things and things start scaling. And then enterprise business agility was meant to have the other people at the table, right? As finance operations, uh, the executive team, and especially the, the business. Uh, and, and that didn't quite happen, right? And then I think that's where things went a bit sideways. And if those people are, are not at the table in terms of, Putting in a new a new operating model, it won't work. If the CEO if the CEO is not sponsoring it, actually, and this I guess was an interesting point on that panel um, at the end of the event, where I, I I challenge some people say like, will this work if the CEO doesn't sponsor it? Like, because I I frankly in terms of the the anecdotal evidence I've seen, it, it tends not to, or it just doesn't, I should say, uh, when there's not. And in some cases, of course, it won't be the CEO directly involved, but at least it's sponsored by the CEO. And there's someone on the executive team reporting to the CEO who's directly responsible for the outcomes of, of putting in place a product operating model. So I think that's the positive thing is, is because we're now framing it as a new operating model, I think that's forcing some of the discussion in terms of we actually need the executive team, including the, the CFO and finance and all those other roles at the table for defining that, understanding how we measure it, understanding the, the roadmap for implementing it, understanding what it changes, right? We no longer maybe need to do software capitalization with timesheets. We're going to do it in a product-oriented way, which, you know, of course, everyone will rejoice, but you can't do that without involving finance. You can't, you can't make that, that change much as everyone wants to see it happen. The organizations haven't, haven't gone there yet. So, uh, so I think those roles are key. And yeah, Dave, that's right. We didn't, there should have been more of them at this event. So I think for all the people who are trying to help with this, I think that the key thing and the limiting factor is bringing in uh, senior leadership to support this change. So, or 
we accept that the business is never going to properly partner with us. And we just build amazing products. So we sort of assume the knowledge the business, we treat them as stakeholders in the same way as if you're building a phone, you don't get all of your phone users to be part of your organization. You literally treat them as a stakeholder and you do really good product management and you do really good uh, stakeholder management and you do really good. And all you need really is the pe people that pay for it and the people that tell you which direction to so the mission, the executive leadership, but everybody else gets assumed into a product organization. And so that technology kind of eats the, uh, I guess it's sort of taking that, well, it eats, eats the, what was the, uh, the New York Times article, software is going to eat everybody's lunch, right? And, and I guess product could perhaps be part of that. So instead of the business being there as a, here, it becomes part of the solution, you know, sort of like, I mean, is, would that be just crazy? Am I just, you know, is it? Yeah. It's a really interesting point. So, and I certainly, I know I've heard myself and I'm talking to, let's say federal agencies, you, you gave kind of the great example uh, and the slightly scary example of how SpaceX is a product oriented organization and Boeing is not and the very different outcomes in terms of what's in space right now, what isn't, um, yeah. that, that results from that and the cost of getting it there, the timeframes. But that said, when I've engaged, worked and supported those federal agencies, uh, of course, the whole product transformation assumes that the funding model of funding programs that turn into projects won't change. So you still need to innovate within that program umbrella that's got project funding um, and put in place a highly effective product organization. And it's possible. Um, and lots of org organizations have done it. So Dave, I guess then, I guess it probably is, I think, so I agree in the sense that for organizations whose actual operating model won't change, that's probably the best approach. And just to create within technology with as effective uh, a translation layer to how things are funded and, uh, and managed and measured on the operation side uh, to create that product organization and to bring product and engineering and business counterparts together to these value streams and, and so on, measure outcomes and focus on, on those great customer outcomes. So the question then becomes is, well, what if, if you've now succeeded at that over the next two years, what are the challenges? And I think some of the challenges, because by the organization not shifting over, will be things like incentive structure, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If people are compensated on going for the biggest budgets and those budgets are measured. And if the organization's organization structure only considers cost, right? Because if finance is only considering the cost of technology, uh, and that's the only thing used for restructuring, not value, not flow, not outcomes. Uh, it's it's just risky because you'll you, you have the most senior leaders in the organization having a only a view on cost and only viewing everything that's being built as cost centers. You've got these product and technology teams who, of course, want to drive profit and outcomes, and then you've got this mismatch. And that mismatch, I guess, in my experience, it's not as bad when everything is rosy and growing. If there are changes <laughs> being made, it's it's. Like, for example, if the macro environment's challenged, it becomes very problematic because then you end up, let's say, with organizations doing cuts of the most uh, effective parts of the organization where they've got the best engineers because they just don't have a view of value or moving entire teams to different regions um, or outsourcing and then having even basically having their economics go completely upside down because they had four times or 10 times the flow uh, on existing near shore teams or things of that sort. And I've, I've, I've absolutely seen those things play out, so. And, and actually, and the model that I was sort of prescribing ultimately includes a lot of um, slack or overhead to enable that sort of duplication of understanding and skill and, and and all the things around creating a totally separate self-sustained product organization in a business that also is doing that it, it, there's a is a significant overhead to to doing that so maybe it would be better to get the business at the table and get the business actively involved in this in this in this um 
transformation. And, and that really talks to one of the things that you have said a few times, you said it on the previous podcast around QBRs and the importance of effectively changing the reporting, the quarterly business reviews, the reporting model, so that product becomes a fundamental part of the of the QB of, of the QBR process. Yeah. And Dave, I, I think it's it is definitely worth just digging into this, I think, a bit further because a lot of the people who I believe a lot of our listeners, either their organizations either have embraced it at the executive level or they haven't. And if they haven't, of course, trying to influence that takes a long time. And so I think we should empowering people with changing as much as they can within their within their span of control is key. So you had this on one of your charts, you had this, which to me was just this really weird split I hadn't seen before, uh, where you had, it said product model, you know, you had your strategy, then a product model in the middle, and then a product operating model. And I said, like, I was looking at like, why the heck is Dave splitting out a product model and a product operating model? And then of course, the and as a, another separate part that, that's connected is the product portfolio management, understanding that yeah. you have a portfolio of products to manage. So I think what's very interesting about that, let's, let's just take the perspective of an, or of an organization whose leadership is stuck. Their, their eyes are elsewhere. They're, they're, you know, there's strategic changes or other, other things, and they're not embracing putting in place a new operating model. I think you're right. I think the, the best thing that our listeners can do is actually fo- like define your product portfolio management, define your product model, um, start creating your own QBR for that, start running yeah, it, yeah. start measuring outcomes. And you know, what hopefully happens is that that actually influences because if you know, invite more and more of the right people. Uh, so even though it's not the actual QBR, you're actually running things in an effective way. And hopefully in the process, teaching the organization, the elements of a product offering your model and why this is more valuable. And I have, Dave, I have seen that work where a, a portion of the organization starts doing things in a new way. And that's how the teaching in the, in the organization happens, not top down. So, no, but no, again, no, no. it's a path. You need that path to, to the, you know, the bigger top down change. You have to get finance involved at some point. I know it was funny. I, I did a, a, a webinar today on defining products and, there was a really interesting question, you know, where does this change come from? Top down, middle out, bottom up, you know, and and I, and I had to say exactly what you're saying. You, it has to be top down. However, if you haven't got that support, yeah. then you can build a really quite an interesting uh, approach to managing the work you're doing as a product portfolio and delivering your capabilities to the business and to the organization you serve as products in a in 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 a different way however how they're going to be funding you is still through initiatives and through other other arcane ways projects you know capital expenditure as opposed to capex versus opex etc and there's going to be some level of translation between that so so i i, I guess I, I yes i guess you're right fake it till you make it as it were um yeah i think that's that's the Best shot you've got. And there was a that week I heard it just a fascinating story um, of uh, a chief technology officer who'd done that, who within a large organization had put in place, reported to the CEO, had put in place a product operating model with kind of all the right things in terms of planning, road mapping, measuring flow, team structure and culture, all those things. And it was up and running. Uh, and with, but it was without proper sponsorship from finance or the CEO who were kind of very focused on more of a business transformation around other digital aspects of their business and, and, and what was happening with AI. And, and it worked. Um, she was able to put in place these highly effective teams. Things were going better. All the metrics were looking good. But then when the organization became challenged in some of the, just the pure business model parts of the transformation, uh, it all snapped back. So the, the CEO basically said, no, every quarter, we're going to define the projects and then we're going to assign the people people to the projects. And so very large number of teams, I'm going to review them and then we'll decide which ones go forward or not. So every quarter, like just the worst case scenario, every quarter, a re- reallocation of people. So now, of course, this person is going to go and implement the product operating model elsewhere <laughs> because this company has now snapped itself back uh, and it's going to be more challenged, not less. 
But I think that the, the journey will continue. A lot of people learned about that. A lot of people learned that it's a better model. So even though we're seeing this dysfunction at the most senior level of this company, where you've got someone who hasn't sufficiently internalized the benefits, I think that the, you know, there'll be some of that DNA there. And, and then the, you know, some of those people will do, do great work at other companies that need this. So, but that's the kind of fragility. So where it really, that, but that, and that came from a really a, a business model change. So. Yeah, we, 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 I, I, I'm seeing that in, in across the whole gamut of organizations. I'm seeing, you know, even famous organizations like, like Spotify recently, uh, I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about how they're increasing team size, moving autonomy up the hierarchy. And the, oh. and the reason primarily to do that is because they have decided they're not in that massive innovation phase. They've decided that risk is more important than reward, <laughs> which is bizarre. But anyway, I, I guess that. And and ultimately, they they have felt that they that for, for many reasons they've decided that that their product can't deal with the continuous sort of ebb and flow of innovation across the grounds of it, and instead they want to manage that and control it and. And, and to some extent, it's about trust as people left and, there's, you know, you, you don't know the teams as well. You've got your organization's grown to a certain side. You've got quarterly, you know, earnings calls that you need to deliver on. So they're going to a very similar, um, slightly different, but but similar in terms of motivation model. I mean, we're seeing that everywhere. And 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 it and it's really interesting because that's the other thing that's that, that I, I heard a lot about that everybody's looking for that free lunch and the 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 project model gives you a, a false sense of security around you know getting a nice shiny feature you fund it it's a bit like shark tank you then next month next quarter you fund something else it gives you that sort of like oh well you know we've we're we're managing risk but we're using this funding model where you only ever give a certain amount. But unfortunately, what that ends up doing is creating, and I heard this a few times at the event, technical debt, which then when we try to implement a product model where that technical debt becomes more transparent and visible, as we're trying to integrate a business strategy and a technical strategy, we call that a product strategy, by the way, uh, that, that integration, that integrated story, and suddenly you're seeing the platform can't sustain the level of change necessary to deliver on the business objectives because of the technical debt that's been accumulated with the years of projects that um that that ultimately ends up you know sort of un undermining your ability to move to a product model because you know that they liked that they're like well they like that false security that projects give you and and the fact that you can say no let's not deal with that let's just focus on these these projects and, and and get these new features or these new capabilities out to market did you hear the technical debt thing uh, as much as i did yes absolutely and that's that's once again you know i think you and i've been hearing that for a very long time but it's interesting that that is getting more prominent and it's good to hear mm. i hear it more prominently in the business context as well is is it's been now a, i think a decade of people trying to elevate the technical debt and and i think it's it's closely related to what you're talking about right the, the the challenge with the project operating model is the false sense of security so it's or, or control right is that you can better control things but you're overly centralizing and you know it's it's uh not to get to just to sidetrack but uh centralization works for totalitarian regimes it doesn't work if you want to empower <laughs> a whole bunch of a very large organization uh, with some independence of action and decision making. So it completely that that it, so it's not necessarily a false sense of control, just a very ineffective sense of control unless you're dealing with a very simple problem. Um, and it just doesn't scale. And it's you know the challenge with technical debt and is that if it's not, and this is just one aspect of it, if if we don't, if you don't expose the economics around, and you know this, this all goes, of course, back to product development flow from Don Reinerson, but if you don't ex understand the economics of building software at a business level, you'll make a bunch of very bad decisions. And we're continuing to see companies make those, those bad decisions 
uh, because of course, again, they're, they're viewing things through a lens of projects and control rather than exposing those dynamics of flow and seeing technical, technical that. I think a lot of that just goes back to the training and education and experience that, that uh, oftentimes high, highly effective business leaders have had around economies of scale. And economies of scale um, are not the same as, as these economics of flow that, that every, every agile team understands, where if you, get, if you try to overload every single team, you'll get less great product, not more. So I think we're kind of still at that same point, but I think the very the very positive thing is um, for those organizations looking at changing their basically deploying a product operating model. Those things are coming to the surface. These yeah. notions of technical debt uh, and of empowerment, of roadmaps, of decentralization, all those sorts of things, um, and of of cascading outcomes and uh, and all of that. The and but I do think. It's a it's a very good point, as I think we all kind of, and I think that was the great thing about the summit is there's a lot of shared vision on needing to get there. It's a question of how your organization gets there, and if your organization is not ready for a product operating model, putting in place that product model and managing and uh, reporting on the portfolio of products is is the best next step. Yeah, definitely the best next step. And the other, obviously, the power of a product paradigm is that you get to contextualize technical debt in terms of its economic impact on the on the things that you're you're delivering, and you get with flow metrics a way to visualize it that that, that is <laughs> that is awful. I mean, no, is 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 empowering, I should say, but usually it's just awful, you know. Um, cost of change increasing over time, you know. The obviously quality um, is is another is another factor as well. So it was interesting though because I I I didn't think we'd be talking about technical debt, and obviously it's something that I spent a lot of time talking about when I was when I was a wee lad, um, and I haven't really spoken as much about it over the last five six years. Now maybe that's and that's worryingly because people have been so concentrated on these feature factory scrum teams and they haven't been thinking about products effectively and value and a holistic view, a holistic view of, of value. Um, they've been concentrating on delivering features in the most effective way possible. That, maybe that's the reason, which is, which is really worrying that I missed that, but it was, it was good to, it was good to, good to hear that. The, the other thing that I heard as well over and over again is there's nothing that technically that can stop a project to product transformation. It's really just a huge people power position, status, authority. It's a, it's a massive change management problem, not a technology problem. Uh, ignoring technical debt for a second in terms of the, its impact on, oh my God, we can't actually deliver anything. But um, it's it really is a, a change management or, or people problem, which shouldn't come as a surprise to me, but I guess it's interesting to hear a very different group of people talk about change management than normally talk about change management. And not, not the consultants, obviously they do that all the time, but the the companies that are in the room well, how do you manage this continuously? How do you, you you have to use an agile incremental approach? You have to obviously raise the the, the things like flow metrics up to that sort of uh, change level to allow them to influence organizational change, incentive structures, uh, etc. I thought that was really quite interesting as well. The sort of like the role of change management. Is that something that you're seeing and that you heard at the at the at the event? Yes, definitely. And I think to your point, I think all the technology pieces are there. Organizations can already do this effectively. Uh, I do think there's this disparity between organizations who have the right kind of visibility and the ones who don't, right? We saw from Vanguard, for example, the fact that they show they measured, you know, I was thrilled to see that they were using plan view viz for this. Um, they, they, they measured flow and whip and showed that the higher whip slowed delivery and created this thing that uh, it was my, my car, the CTO of Vanguard, who showed this, this ideation cliff where all this work was happening in ideation, but there wasn't 
capacity to deliver on it, of course, even determining what the technical feasibility of some of the work was taking the capacity of the team. So there's, there's just this mismatch that they were then able to address because they had the right visibility. So I think it is important that organizations understand this is something they need to invest in. They can't just invest in, let's setting up their scrum teams and then basically not having infrastructure for making that the, sure that the right work is getting to those teams. So you, you can keep blaming yourself, Dave, <laughs> and I'm not realizing that Scrum is, um, is uh, in a lot of organizations has created these feature factory teams, but I don't think that's where the problem is. The problem truly is upstream of the teams. And if you don't actually look across teams and see, okay, what work are we giving them? They already know which technical debt work they need to do. They know it better than anybody. If not listening to those teams and they're saying how much of their capacity every single increment should go to reducing technical debt, then again, we're missing the picture. Or if we're not seeing, and back to that Vanguard example, uh, how we're actually overloading the teams. And if we stop overloading them, what the economic benefit of that is, or what, as, as you said earlier, um, what the economic impact of reducing tech debt is. Uh, so, so I think all of the pieces are there and it really is, again, back around, which is why last time we chatted, I harped on this, is em embracing that kind of visibility as part of your, elevating as high as possible, so let's say to the quarterly business re review processes so that it's not ignored. And that's, I think, a pattern I've seen in organizations who are doing well in adopting a product offering model is that they elevate these concepts to their business counterparts um, as much as possible as part of their budgeting and strategic planning process as well. Yeah, it was it was just funny because obviously you I, I I don't know how many years ago your book came out five six years ago six yeah six years ago so I remember that um, cross country flight where I reviewed it and, and invested a significant amount of effort into that review Thank just you. just reminding you of that it you know uh, and and I remember thinking it, it's interesting you know that obviously the emphasis on flow metrics the emphasis on on that sort of that those the, the examples like BMW etc and, and and the bank and and it was just so funny that as I was sitting in the room in New York City that had no windows, so I couldn't look out of them. <laughs> I had to concentrate on the content. The um, that it was just like hearing it again, almost the importance of that visibility, the importance of that that the, you know that continuous change management process, the the importance of empowering managers and leaders throughout the organization to take those metrics and actually be able to use them to drive change. And then the Vanguard example is also interesting because it was also the scope of where they applied the metrics was much broader than perhaps most IT organizations would, yeah. would have would have applied. So they because that cliff would have been a complete mystery to most. I mean, you know, they'd have just gone, well, why are we not getting the stuff we want? Well, let's do more. Come on. It must be a yeah. throughput issue. Let's, let's increase the whip. And, and that yeah. would have been the exact opposite thing to actually be successful. Well, that's exactly it. And that's the challenge where if all that's being measured and all that the light is shining on is the capacity of the, of the scrum teams. Again, you could not have done what they did, right? And notice that the problem is actually upstream of those teams. So... But then Dave, how, so yes, it is a, that you can, we can frame that all as a change management. How, what, what do you think we do? Like why is, for those organizations that are stuck, how do we can catalyze the change management that's needed? Because the data is there, the technologies are there. It's, it's kind of all there. So I think kind of back to your point, is this now just a change management exercise? Well, I think there's, I think there's three things that's, that, that stand out for me. Um, number one, I think that the, the the people that are now in the executive positions that are driving these organizations to the future, they may not be digital native, but they that their, their children certainly are. You know, whereas you know they we were dealing with leaders that were three degrees away from digital natives and the like. And I and I do see a change. I do see. Even if you know they're bankers or they're consumer packaged goods people or, or whatever, I see that that willingness to embrace technology in in, in terms of a, a business driver and enable that, as opposed to treating it completely separately. I think that will have a change and will have an impact. And and I know that's got 
you know, it's like, what do they say about science, right? Science progresses one funeral at a time, but obviously I'm not being quite as negative as that. But certainly in terms of the, these leader roles, I think that will have an impact. I think number two, I think it was really refreshing to see some of the big consulting companies talking a very similar talk that, that you put in your book and, and I've been writing about a lot recently. Um, and it, 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 it's really exciting because they do have the ears of those boards and, and, and they do have the access that honestly, as much as, you know, two good looking bull gentlemen like us have fabulous access, we don't have that access. And uh, I think that's going to have an, a huge impact. And I think the, you know, and the third thing is the, the, the delivery capability and the technology, you know, things like DevOps, things like, um, you know, things like Viz and, and the like, having all those things in place, even if they're perhaps working as a feature factory, will then instantly be catalyzed, you know, will, will be a great catalyst once those leaders and that McKinsey kind of consultant or Bain or BCG or Accenture or whatever they are, drive the change. It will be like an, a floodgate opening. And so I think the capability, you know, the fact that we have so many Scrum teams, and even though they aren't necessarily practicing Scrum as I would love it, they at least understand if you give them a product goal, you give them a backlog, you give them a good scrum master, you give them a good product owner, they, they can deliver stuff. So if you point it in the right direction with those other changes, I think. So, so, so I'm actually pretty optimistic that we've got now everything in place to drive the transformation that you so eloquently described in the book six years ago. That's great to hear, Dave. And I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think I am, I am, we are seeing, and the data is showing as well that more organizations yeah. are embracing this. And I think you, there's a, one of the points you made there, I think is, is definitely worth reflecting on, which is that a lot of these organizations have undergone already their, the cloud transformation shift to whatever, architectural shift to microservices, but basically yeah. they've got the wiring in a place for, for delivering quickly. And this was actually part of the Vanguard story, right? They, this, they, yeah, yeah. They, they'd done public cloud, microservices, agile, and then they realized their constraint really was at that operating model level and, and that ideation cliff and these sorts of things, but it was all, all anecdotal. So I think the very positive things is because of their agile practices, because of these new engineering practices, whether it's cloud or platform engineering or wherever the organization's on their journey, um, the the infrastructure's in place and now the bottleneck is actually shifting the organization model and that's becoming more visible because the teams are saying oh no we're already delivering quickly no we, we already are able to deploy multiple times a day so and that that to your point that was much less the case five ten years ago yeah yeah i mean it, it the, the, the problem we saw over and over again was you know uh, over and over again was you know de definition of done the ability to release the the technical constraints uh, were ultimately undermining the ability to deliver. And I have to say that uh, things like Copilot are only going to accelerate the team's ability to deliver amazing stuff and also deal with some of the um, staffing crises that Agile brings on where you need cross-functional teams with all the skills. You actually don't so much now or you won't so much. You know, you'll data scientist for an end develop you'll just be able to take advantage of llms and 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 things like copilot to help you do that so so i, I i'm 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 pretty i i left new york city with a, a feeling of optimism um but a feeling of there's still a lot to do you know i i think getting the business at events like that. And when I say business, I, I probably mean operational business. I probably mean the people that are, uh, aren't necessarily, you know, brokers or if you're in finance or people working in the, in, in the branches or on the code centers, but the people that are operating those systems and processes, getting them to sort of take more of an active role in the transformation. I think that that's something I, I felt responsible for how how do we do that you know how do i how do we start building that up but in general i felt incredibly positive about the opportunity that that lays ahead yeah i i did as well 
And it was not only because we had a chance to, to debrief about the event over a drink. That was really nice. <laughs> but but what happened was I, you know, I came up with my five anti-patterns of a product transformation. So I was, as I was going into the event, I was looking at, you know, why isn't this working faster? Why, why can't these organizations get out of their own way? Uh, and then like you, uh, I think came up with a, a very positive view of the progress that's being made. So. Yes, yes, you did kick off the event with a little bit of a negative sort of position. And I was like, oh, hopefully we'll get, and then it, it just got better and better. I particularly really liked what Vanguard had to say. I, I liked, there was, there was a lot of really good people talking about their journeys and being very, very open and honest about the challenges and, and, and some really good solutions. So so I thank you for inviting me to the event and, and and hosting that event. I thought it was awesome. Hopefully we'll do another one next year. And for our listeners, uh, watch out. We'll, uh, you know, when it comes, we'll, we'll obviously make sure that you're aware of it and maybe you can join in this, uh, this, this journey that we're all on. Um, so we have to, I could talk all day with you, Mick, as we have done in the past, usually right. over a bottle of red wine. Um, unfortunately, we can't. We we have other things to do, and our listeners have much more important things to do, probably. So, um, thank you for spending the time, and thank you for sharing your thoughts on project to product, the the event uh, in in New York City, and obviously your 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 thoughts on the the whole change that you're seeing with your customers um, and the, the market in general. My pleasure, Dave. Thanks for having me. Always great to to chat with you. And listeners, thank you for listening to today's Scrum.org community podcast. Uh, I was here with Dr. Mick Kirsten, CTO of PlanView, talking about project to product. I'm, I have a feeling that he'll be on this podcast a few more times over the next year. I got some hard questions that are bubbling in the back of my mind that I'm just going to get ready to, to hit him with later in the next 12 months. So, so thank you for listening uh, to us today. Uh, if you liked what you heard, Please subscribe, share with friends, and of course, come back and listen to some more. I'm lucky enough to have a variety of guests talking about everything in the areas of professional Scrum, product thinking, and of course, agile. Thanks, everybody. Scrum on.